Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bill Jordan here with Art with Bill. Another fantastic episode with a fantastic artist. Today we have Mary Aslan all the way from California. Morning, Mary. How are you doing today? Good morning. I'm doing very well. Thank you. You know, before I ask you, where are you from? And I think we talked many, many moons ago about where you're from. Where are you from anyway? Well, I'm originally prior to San Juan Capistrano. Uh, before here, I lived in Seattle. And then uh, before that, mostly the West Coast. Um, I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, but mostly I'm a West Coast girl. Lived a couple years in Minnesota, uh, but mostly from the Pacific Northwest and now here in Southern California. Oh my God. How'd you like the, the wonderful winters in Minnesota? You know, we really loved them. It was so different. And there's nothing like skating on a frozen pond um, and seeing the ice fishermen. It, it was very special, actually. Every, every place has its unique beauty, and we definitely found it there. We loved it. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I'm kind of like a, a warm weather person, so when it gets to being cold weather, I don't, I don't care too much of that. So. Oh, well, yeah, it, it's, there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, I, the cold was shocking. There's no doubt about it. Um, and to push the grocery cart through the snowy parking lot is, is not easy as you wrap your scarf around your face, but um, it does have its beauty for sure. Oh, right, right. Of course, of course. <laughs> so, so, so you're basically a, a West Coast person and you grew up in, in, in Utah. And when did you get into the, into the arts? Well, let's see. I always wanted to be an artist, but I didn't realize and didn't know how to do it. I uh, took a course in college that had absolutely no substance to it. And as a, a freshman, 18 years old, I, I somehow had this intuitive sense that this isn't going to give me what I need and want. And... Um, so I got a degree in geography and became a map maker oh. for many years as a way to uh, channel my love of the um, at least graphic design into something that would allow me to make a living. Uh, but in the back burner, I always kept the, the art sizzling and subscribed to the artist magazine and did some paintings. And um, when my children were born, um, I was able to leave my... 60, 70, 80 hour a week consulting job and um, be home with my children. And when they were 10 months old, I started taking a painting class in the uh, community where I live. And it just grew from there. Um, I did commissions of dogs. Uh, I painted portraits of, of people, houses. Um, when we moved to Minnesota, I was hired to be the artist in residence there at the school because there was a lot of funding for the arts. Oh, cool. And <laughs> yeah, gradually as my children grew and I had more time to, to, um, to do painting, paint from the, the model, um, <clears throat> by the time we moved down here to California, and I did have a, a paid job as well. Fridays were my painting days because I worked Monday through Thursday. Okay as an ESL tutor, but on Fridays they were my painting days, um, and it was enough um, kind of slogging behind the scenes on things that I really loved to paint and doing a few little commissions on the side, that by the time we moved here 10 years ago, um, I, I knew that Southern California had a wonderful art community, but I was very unprepared for the extent of it. And... Um, Two years after we moved here, I found myself an exhibitor at the Festival of Arts in Laguna wow. Beach. And um, my art career has far exceeded uh, my expectations. And I'm very grateful for all the opportunities here. I mean, you know, when I moved down here, um, it seems crazy to think about now, but, um, you know, the, the web and Facebook and all that wasn't as... Um, prolifically used as it is now. So if you live in a tiny little burg somewhere in the U.S., you can certainly market your work, and that's to the benefit of those artists. But at the time that I landed here as an artist in Laguna Beach, um, it, was, it was a wonderful experience to start out at the Art Affair, then at the Sawdust Festival, and I've been an exhibitor at the Festival of Arts now for eight years. And it's, um, 
it's an opportunity to meet um, people face to face who love art. Um, you know, people who love art, students who love art, collectors who love art, uh -huh. and it's it's been wonderful. It's it's far exceeded my dreams. So when I when I was an eighteen year old freshman in college, I thought I don't want to be a starving artist peddling my art on a street corner. I've got to find something that's a little more steady, um, which I did. Um, as it I, as it turned out, I I have been able to make a career of this, and it's uh, I'm just grateful every every single day. It's a wonderful thing. So now, Mary, how how is it that you had that instinct, that insight as a 18 year old person, 19 year old person, <clears throat> to recognize that you needed to have some type of money income flow to really support your work? Well, um, I, you know, I, I had an uncle who had a tremendous influence on me. He, his paintings were hanging in my house, our house when I was growing up. And I know that, that he, he was doing plein air painting before it was kind of trendy and common to do it. Yeah. And um, I always sensed in him this deep desire to be an artist and he did beautiful paintings and he became an architect um, and there was always this buzz in the family about that's what he had to do to support his family right. and you know you hear over and over oh starving artist starving artist starving artist and so by the time you're 18 if you've seen an uncle who wants to be a full-time artist who isn't and you hear starving artist oh. then it, you, you get this sense that, well, I guess artists, there's just no way for artists to really support themselves. Mm. And, um, and, you know, the, the other part of that is that because at the time I was at the University of Washington in Seattle, the focus was, uh, they were just, the, the, the abstract expressionist movement was still fairly strong there and the teachers didn't really know how to teach representational art yeah. and so when you have a sense i think that if a teacher there had corrected my drawing or had said you know this is really really good but you really need to improve here i would have had a sense that there is a there's a larger body of knowledge here that I can grow into. And with that body of knowledge, I can do something with it. Right. But if you're not, for 10 solid weeks, the, the uh, instructor uh, who wasn't the professor, she was a teaching assistant, walked around the easels and the only word she said for 10 weeks was the word interesting. <laughs> there, was, there was absolutely zero instruction. And I thought, well, if I'm going to, by definition, you can make a living at something, I think, if you become competent at it. But I'm not seeing the path of competence here. And so I think the starving artist and the fact that the, pro, the one class I took didn't have enough substance to let me realize that there was a body of knowledge here to grow into to eventually share as a teacher or create something that somebody might, might want to have in their home. Both of those factors led me to believe that um, that I needed to choose a different path. So how did that make you feel knowing that your instructor or the TA would walk around and say interesting? How did that make you feel? Well, I, I think I was so befuddled. I, 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 was, just, I was just befuddled. Um, and, and I think that, that part of me thought that art is certainly about self-expression and and it has to be at, at its base that that's what it is because at the end of the day we're all artists we just choose a different medium for for what we we do whether we paint or cook or um, plant a beautiful garden or or, or build a skyscraper um, art is at some level is, is seeded by personal expression but um, I, I think that, how did it make me feel? I thought, you know, I just, I, I need to feel that there's something holistic and a, a bigger reality here than just 
personal expression. And so I, I, I just felt like there wasn't anything to grab onto. You know, what, and, and you know, this was in the era before you could go to the web and, and, cool. and, and type out, okay, I, I'm going to look to see what there is. I mean, it sounds and seems so archaic now, but if you wanted to learn about art instructions or art school, or art instruction or art schools, um, you know, I mean, here, here's an example. I, I, it's only been recently that books on Joaquin Soroya have been published in English, just in the last six, seven years. Before that, they were in Spanish. So, I mean, he's one of my heroes, as he is of many artists. You know, you don't just go to the college library and check out a book on Soroya and figure out how did he learn what he learned. You know, it was in the age before the web. And so get, gleaning this kind of knowledge is what does it mean to be an artist was really much harder to come by. Sorry about that. I forgot to turn mine off. It's okay. So, so that's interesting because Soroyas, now, is that, is that one of your mentors in terms of style? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's about, by far and away the, the hero for me that floats to the top. I mean, there are many, but... Um, he he was a genius uh, beyond all all comprehension and uh, um, well first of all his drawing skills were were impeccable and and secondly his expressive use of um, in his brush strokes and color were unique to him and. Um, you know, he was able to do these very large paintings of people, uh, very large, uh, you know, most of the time those are done in small studies. I do them most often in small studies, but to do these very large figurative paintings. Right, right. Um, and be so accurate with them and so expressive and so fluid. Um, and his compositions, his design, uh, they're, they're they're perfect. And the other thing is that he just was a wonderful man. I mean, he was very devoted to his wife and his children. And um, I just, I, overall, um, I just, he's my hero, Bar Barnett. And, and so now, when did you come across him? I came across him um, when I started studying with Ned Mueller, who was, um, fabulous painter. He's in um, Renton, Washington, where I used to live, in Washington State, where I used to live. And he um, exposed me to the work of Soroya. And I, I just felt my head explode um, when he showed me some of these things. And I thought, okay, where, where have I been all my life? So this was probably, oh gosh, 20, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Wonderful. So, so now, with all that going on, right? I mean, like having these, uh, can I say, uh, many eruptions or discoveries, like how did you blend the, the, the creativity or the freestyle with, with, with the, the form? Is that what you do? I mean, you have, a, you have a nice blend. I see your work, it's like, it's very expressive, very lyrical, and at the same oh. time, it's great structure. Well, thank you, you know, um... I, I, I think that probably painting from life, painting, painting things from life has been probably the single biggest teacher, that and drawing from the, the, the model, um, and has, has been very significant and um you know when the model is changing pose frequently when the flower petals are uh dropping when the light is changing um you don't have time really to think about what style do i have or what do i want to say you become subservient in a beautiful way to what's ahead before you and I think that probably what I like best is, and it, 
is just that little bit of anxiety or a lot of anxiety that comes from, yes. I have no idea what I'm going to do next, but yeah. I, have to, I have to respond. And so it causes me to get my ego out of the way and not overthink what am I trying to say. Ooh. And then after that, okay. then I backfill, okay, I didn't, I didn't expect, I really failed it in, in this painting in this way. And then I'll go back and look at the work of those artists that I admire, uh, not as a specific technique per se, but just as a way to kind of fill my head with the way they saw the world. And then, and then shut that part of my head off and then go back to, to responding. And, and, um, and, you know, I, I guess that, you know, the poet Mary Oliver said that she, I, I, I don't remember quite how she worded it, but that she shamelessly borrows from everybody who's come before her. So, and I'm the same. I mean, I look to Soroya and, uh, in, the, in the past, and I look to an artist like Daniel Gerhardt's, who's... Um, my present modern day hero uh -huh. and um you just incorporate some of the way they saw the world into what you do but it needs to be a per you need to you can't go to the easel and say i'm going to paint like soroy or i'm going to paint like dan oh, right, you right, have right, right. like yourself now here's something that i, I find interesting you said you had, to get, you had to get your ego out of the way how, how do you do that i mean what, what's your process is that that's really that's really a good question and it's harder and harder and harder to do when i really threw myself into painting um where i was at when i had more time and this would have been about 15 years ago you know i painted in a little uh duck shed that had been converted to an office and there was no there was no wi-fi there was no computer screen there wasn't i didn't even have a mobile phone i went out there and i shut the door and i set up my um still life and i started painting um and, and I didn't think about it because I thought, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to paint what I see and, and uh, try to do so and give, give honor to the beauty of the subject before me. It was honestly easier to kind of keep ego at bay then. And it's a little harder now because um, at the drop of a hat, we can call up a million images of of people who are extraordinary at what they do. And so then you shut off those images and then you say, okay, but now I have to go find my voice and block all that out when you, there's, there's just an extraordinary number of fabulous artists out there. And it's hard not to feel inadequate, you know, and say, well, I don't know why I even bother, you know? So it's hard, it's not easy. Um, keeping getting ego out of the way uh, is is not easy. It's it's shutting off the voice of just shutting off the voices in your head. And and maybe that's why I prefer to paint from life and with the changing light is that I don't have time to think about what I think about it. I just have to respond before the light changes right. when the model moves. Right. And so that does help me keep ego out of it because there's no time to worry about my own self. Oh, I got it. Okay. So, so, so when, when you're one with nature, as it were, in a Zen sense, then truly you're, you're with, without, without ego. Yeah, exactly. That's a good way to say it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and it's really, I mean, it's amazing that you have that insight because what I can see and what I've experienced, most artists don't have that, or the ones that I've come in contact with, they're, they're in a different mindset. You're, you're more like... Uh, like uh, Thoreau and Walden, you know, you go to the out in the woods for the year and you're there. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Well, you, you, you know, that's its own reward. You know, being there, it's, it's odd how um, being there is its own reward. And, and I've yeah. had students ask me, well, how can I, you know, get into a gallery and how can I, you know, get awards for my work? And I, um, 
you know, it's not that we don't all want that kind of success, mm -hmm. but I read about an artist in Canada who is, and I, I can't remember his name, he's successful, successful by any standard. Um, he's achieved worldwide fame, but I read an interview with him where he said he wanted to go to the backwoods in his canoe by himself and paint. And I told my students, nothing separates you from that artist because the goal has to be to put yourself in a position of painting the things that you love. And whether it's a success or a failure, the fact that you were there and responded to it is its own reward. Right, right. I was thinking that, that a lot of people seek, seek out the solitude of nature as a way of shedding all that uh, civilized stuff. Uh, True. But it seems, I mean, I've experienced myself personally, and I don't know how few, but you know, you can do that right where you are. You can do that right where you are. Very, very good point. And you know, it's interesting you should say that. Um, it's funny you should bring that up because I had, I have some collectors that wonderful people sent me a bouquet of flowers. Um, and they sent it with this quote, the artist's world is limitless. It can be found anywhere from where he lives or a few feet away. It is always at his doorstep by Paul Strand. Right, that's, that's amazing. And so like, I guess in a way that's why, that's why your work, I, I like your work so much. It's so, it's very, uh, well, we're gonna get into that right now. It's, anything else well, you want to we, you know, anything else you want to talk about that before we get into the works? Oh, no, no, okay. thank you. I was starting, this is like, what is this? This is like a little cactus flower or something? Well, this is a painting. Um, sometimes the stories that I want to tell in my paintings uh, come, come about through forethought, and some of them are by accident. This one is complete forethought. I've been trying to do this, I had been trying to do this particular painting for um, years. And one day uh, on my hike up in the hills, I saw these thistles and the distance um, mountains going back and all of a sudden I could see it instantly. I could see the finished painting in my head, ancestral memory because those thistles have always reminded me of a dried sunflower. So I raced back down to the store, I got some sunflowers, I hauled the sunflowers up to the hills, I uh, laid them out in the way I wanted them, and uh, I did a plein air, pretty good sized plein air study, um, and I, I felt this tremendous relief that finally, after years of thinking about this, I knew what I wanted to say. And uh, this painting um, is one that my husband has claimed for his own. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, ancestral memory, and it's um, kind of hard to put into words, but uh, metaphorically, um, the sunflowers are young, the thistles are older, they're still beautiful and exquisitely beautiful in their older dying state and then it, it, there, there's sort of this sense of kind of looking visually back into the past. And I, I love more and more to put um, still life in um, a, a deeper atmospheric space and so mm. this paint for me fit um, was very satisfying on, on many, many levels. It, it, it was one that kind of painted itself. Very satisfying piece for me personally. I felt like I finally got something out of my system that I'd been thinking about for years. Oh, okay. Well, well let me ask you, how many children do you have, by the way? Well, I have um, three children. They happen to be triplets, and they will be um, my gosh, they'll be 30 years old this October. Oh, crazy. my God, get out of here. You're only, like, <laughs> you're only 35 yourself. Oh, thank you. Keep it coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, I asked that question at this point because this piece has maybe asked you that question because it's about, you know, heredity, passing on stuff, moving, moving from one part to the other. Yes, that's, that's, that's it. It's um, visually, it's just, um, 
that you know I, I don't want to be overly um, suggestive in the the story per se um, but um, it's always nice when people find their own story but um, yeah, yeah. I, it was one of those paintings that the minute I looked and I, I saw those dried thistles I thought ancestral memory that's it that's what I've been trying to say all right, let's move on to the next one. This is my newest still life. <clears throat> I set this one up <clears throat> just outside the window where I'm sitting now. And um, I love painting these uh, still life and figure in dramatic light. And um, uh, very, also very satisfying piece to paint. I did a very, um, a fairly large study and I was just I was deciding am I going to finish the plein air piece that I started or am I going to start start fresh and I decided to start fresh because sometimes I can after the study has kind of incubated for a few days and I'm then I can go back and kind of do a reinterpretation so this is my newest piece it'll be in a show in Laguna Beach in April <clears throat> well I just, I just love it I just like your the, the it's just very, what I call lyrical. It's just beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank I, you. I, uh, lyrical, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the quality that rings for me and throughout your work. It's just like, wow, I mean, how do you, how do, you do that, Mary? What's the... <laughs> well, you know, it's been, um, it's interesting, you know, when you, again, I mean, I, I had to be in the study, boy, it worked very, very fast. And uh, one thing I have learned is um, using Charles Hawthorne's method of making color accurate color notes. And when I first read about that, I thought he, he would say, well, forget about the drawing, make accurate color notes next to each other, and then the drawing will take care of itself. And initially I thought, I, I don't know, I, how does that work? Because the drawing is so significant. Well, I'll be darned if he was not right, because when I'm able to, making those quick color notes, as I see them very, very quickly, um, if, if I am practicing my drawing when painting the model and so on, then I've still got that skill um, that I'm continually working on. But I, because of that, I don't have to worry about focusing on the drawing in something like this. I can focus on the light and the color, and the drawing truly does take care of itself. So, now, What do you mean when you say color notes? Color notes, um, gosh, grabbing the stick of pastel and making the best guess I can as to the color that I'm seeing and modifying and then uh, going to the adjacent area and making uh, a color that, that is in proper relationship to the color that I've just put on. If you can think of color notes, um, imagine a mosaic of color spots over a two-dimensional surface that somehow, if you take those color spots, it's kind of a, a, a mosaic, essentially, of, of spots of color and oh, and it, you know they're they're artists you could say you could call them alternatively than other than than color notes you could call them painted spots of color but it's just easier and more fun to say color notes right right that's that's why i asked because that's color, color notes like you taking notes for a class yeah no no but think of it like a musical note oh more like a musical uh -huh. note but it's a color. But it's a color note instead. Oh, I see. Okay, cool, man. So, so you know, I, I, I've I've had this thought in my mind. Now, do 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 colors have? Are they accountable to a note, like like in music? Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's uh, you know, the the most representational or non-representational painters, you know, abstract painters as well. I don't don't you feel like the corollary in with, when you think of the arts, which branches of art are most closely tied together? Um, 
you know, visual arts and music definitely, I think, are very closely tied together. And so, yeah, when you say lyrical, um, yes, right, right, you know, definitely, som somber, somber minor notes. This is yeah. obviously a main. This is a painting painted in a in a major key. When you think, I, yeah. I would probably say it's a key of key of G. <laughs> I would say so. You are right. <laughs> You're right, Bill. Key of G. Totally agree. All right. <laughs> what we got going on here? Well, this is a painting I set up in my studio, uh, or a scene I set up in my studio, and I have skylights in, and um, some high windows that were just casting the most beautiful soft light. And I painted this painting a good part of it, mostly from life. And um, and you know, speaking of of music, uh, you know, you have. Am I using the full range of the keyboard, or am I using a more limited uh, range? And in this case, it's a it's a more limited range. It's a higher key painting. There aren't um, some. There there's only a few very deep darks, and I, I do think about the value structure of my painting and the overall mood very significantly, more and more and more, um, in, in kind of setting the feeling in the mood uh, for the painting, so. Now, speaking of mood now, and going back to music, this would be, you know, it's a melancholic, melancholic mood, right? Yeah, it's got, as opposed to the prior one, um, Beckoning Spring, this one's called Blush and Happenstance, and it does, it has, it has a little bit more of a, of a, um, maybe the positive side of melancholy. Yes, yes, yes. Right. It's not like, it's not like somber, like, you know, like, uh, no. it's not like a yeah. Edgar Allan Poe or anything like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I like it. It's good stuff. Thank you. Here we go. This one was, um, I love the color blue. Anyone who knows me knows how much I love blue. And um, this uh, flow blue uh, ceramics pottery are thrilling to look at <laughs> by virtue of the, the color of the glaze. But this painting was, um, I was trying to capture this feeling in general of flowing blue. And so I, I took some uh, transparent cloth and painted it with blue watercolor paint and used it as, and I let the, the paint flow onto the cloth. Mm -hmm. And then I used that as a backdrop for the painting itself. Oh, yes, and, uh, I love yes. I love these iceberg roses. And um, this also was a painting I painted from life. And um, boy, it was thrilling. And, you know, sometimes I, I, I love, I've painted, hundreds of watercolors and I, I love the watercolor medium and and any time that I can convey kind of the watery looseness of watercolor to some degree in, in paintings I, I like to do that and this one was, I was able to do that so I enjoy I mean it was kind of metaphorical given that I have watercolor painted on the cloth itself yes so. right right water on water water on water yeah yes. equals water <laughs> This is a different thing here. This one, um, this is a painting that I spent many weeks, if not months, thinking about before I set it up. And um, I wanted to, I was intrigued by the, by the translucent material and Boy, this is very multi-layered. I'll try to be as brief as I can. Uh, this painting is called Veil of Tears. And um, I, I was, there was in a situation in my family that was a difficult one. And I, I was using this as a, a metaphor for, and everything's fine now, but um, praise God. But um, I was using this as a, this, this is, was met, kind of metaphorical for, the sadness that that humans can experience at times and that and not to be overly literal with it but 
that when, when you do feel a little bit sad, you there's this tendency to kind of want to hide. And so the veil is a little bit of a metaphor for the, the translucent cloth is we, we want to kind of hide our emotions, but the tears come out anyway. Um, and uh, so, and I, I love the, I love poetry and words and I love the, just the feel of the words veil of tears. And so this, um, that's what this painting was about. But, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't really want, I'm not a somber, somber, sad person. I don't really want I didn't really want the painting to have a heavy, dark, somber feel. Um, and you know, ultimately too, this was about experimentation with texture and light and atmosphere and, and beauty. And um, you know, in the, uh, we don't see a lot of materials and fabrics now that have a lot of po poetry and romance to them. And, and this is an opportunity to, to paint them. Here's an interesting question, I think, anyway. What would happen, I mean, why is it that you, you favor the, uh, the energized as opposed to the not energized? In other words, like, you know, you don't, no one wants to paint depressed pictures, but some people do. Why is that, is that for you? Why is that? Say, say that last part again, some people want to what? Some people, they, they paint depressed paintings. Oh. Why is that oh, for you? You know, I, I can't, I'm just not cut from that cloth. I'm, I'm a hopeful, positive person. And um, I always want to see beauty and light on the other side of sorrow and difficulty. And, gotcha. uh, and so um, I think that there could be a catharsis if something was, if, if, if somebody was experiencing a terrible tragedy and they went by themselves into a room and and uh, painting could be incredibly dark or and maybe that would be something that they would share as you know and I've seen some of those paintings uh, that those types of paintings incredibly moving and very mm. cathartic to be able to to feel that depth of emotion yes. um, and uh, boy, I applaud the painters that do that well. Um, I don't know. I've never done one like that. I, I guess maybe uh, what it speaks to is I've, I've had a very blessed life. I haven't had a tragic life. And, um, and maybe there'll come a time when that kind of painting will need to be expressed by virtue of what I experience. Hmm. Okay. I'll, I'll let that go. Uh, now this one here. When do we eat? <laughs> yeah, this is when I was in bed one night and I was thinking, wow, wouldn't it be cool to see what dappled light and shadow patterns look like on top of a white cake? What would that look like? Mm. And, um, and so I made the cake and I, I got a lemon tree, which are, you know, the citrus trees down here in California are ubiquitous, they're everywhere. And so it was really, this was a very, very fun painting to do. And um, setting, positioning the table next to the lemon tree and getting everything just so to get the patterns that I wanted. It was, you know, Bill, all of these really at the end of the day, they're all experiments. What if, what if, what if it was this, what if it was that? And um, just a way to, to, to pushed me uh, as an artist and see the, the beauty of the world in a new way. And I, I wasn't sure what, what is this painting gonna, going to be like? And, and the, the glass of lemonade um, was an afterthought. And I thought, wow, that's really a fun, fun thing to do. So it was, this was a very fun painting. All right, I, I like it. Makes you, oh, she, oh, she got my taste. What type of cake is that anyway? Um, it's a white cake. Everyone thinks it's a lemon cake, and that's okay. And let me tell you, having it set, be, it was set up for, oh gosh, a week. And let me tell you, <laughs> after the painting was finished, you didn't want to eat that cake. It had, because it was sitting outside, and it oh, had flies man. and dust on it. <laughs> oh, it did? oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, guess, I guess Marie Antoinette wouldn't have liked that. No, that's right. She would not have. <laughs> <coughs>
So what's this one here? Well, um, I was I was thinking one day, I was sitting in my booth at the Festival of Arts and I was pondering the idea that all, uh, um, Richard Schmidt said it um, and others, all art is a self-portrait of, it, it, at some level, it's a self-portrait. So I was thinking, okay, well, if that's the case, what is going on in my head most of the time, just myself? And uh, for me, there's a lot of, uh, in, in one realm, there's a lot of competing interests. I mean, I, I, I do play, I have played the flute. Um, just for myself, not professionally or anything. Um, I love I love light and flowers and beautiful things. And and I got to thinking, you know, there's so much around us to distract us in the way of beautiful things. There's music. There's light. There's birds singing. There's all kinds of things. And I thought, what a neat idea! Beautiful distraction to be. To, to, go, to go down one path and then all of a sudden be distracted by something else beautiful over here and then you follow that path while you're distracted by something else beautiful over here. And so the idea of um, beautiful distraction kind of took shape in my mind. And I thought, well, what does that look like? What does it look like? And this is the painting that I instantly came into my head so that when I post the model, I have to tell you, I handed her my flute. She wrote, wore the perfect skirt and the perfect blouse. Um, I handed her my flute and this sheet music and I went to my neighbor's um, house across the street and asked him if I could pose a model in his driveway. And it turned out that the light coming through the his orange trees was perfect oh. and when the model took her her pose I, I actually felt myself get very weepy because um i've been thinking this this painting kind of crystallized in my head and all of a sudden there it was i was seeing i was seeing it it was real now the model was standing there yeah. and i I could not get started on this fast enough. And um, this actually is a six foot high pastel painting and it's very, very unusual to paint pastels that large. Wow. But I did a lot of research. Um, I spoke to the curator of works on paper at the Getty Museum in LA about some of the archival um, issues relative to large pastel paintings. She was wonderful enough in her busy life to call me. We had a wonderful conversation. And um, I find it difficult to do really, really small paintings. I like to paint things mostly life-size. So the yeah. fact that this standing figure makes her almost life-size. And it was an incredibly fulfilling painting to do. And the, the thing is, is that there's no way for me ahead of time to orchestrate the light. I can't, when I'm working in my studio, of course, I, with artificial light, I can do that. But, but part of the uh, thrill of this journey is I can't predict the pattern of, of the light. And, you know, just providential things like the, um, the angle of the flute is parallel to the shafts of uh, light on the, the building behind. You know, just some of these beautiful design things that I could never have planned for. So it was very fulfilling. Yes. So now, this is six feet. How long did it take you to complete this work? Oh, several months. Um, I had, uh, let's see, I had, I had uh, her composed for me in January, and I finished in late May. And I, um, I actually had her come back and pose again. Um, it was a very long, long process. I did several studies. Um, oh, right. Okay. But it's, it's really, this, this is like a, it's, it's whimsical in the sense that there's no set time period. It looks like it could be, you know, early Californian, you know, uh, yet it could be current as it is today. Well, I really, really appreciate you saying that because um, I, I don't want to paint, I, I, I don't want to set pieces too specifically in a certain era. So thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, just, I'm just speaking what you said, that's all. <laughs> all right, now this one here, 
Okay, what's up with this? Run it to me. What's the story in this one? Well, Casey came to post for me, and I got a good study for one painting. Um, and then I thought, gosh, we still have a little bit of time left. And um, so I said, well, why don't you, why don't we have you do something else? So she started walking down the path, and all of a sudden I just, I said, stop, don't move, stop. <laughs> uh -huh. And I had got a very good, really I'm thrilled with the study I got of her, a good, good, a nice big one. And uh, again, I thought about finishing the study, but I thought, no, I want to include more um, background and landscape elements. I actually got the study I got was of her, but um, the wind blew her dress and the light shone through and the light on her shoulders and the cast shadow. Um, it, it just, uh, and the key, the light, uh, the, the very, very little, you know, real dark and overall high key painting. It was uh, just a thrill. The wind was blowing her hair. It was just one of those providential moments I could never have imagined ahead of time. Unlike some of the others where I've set them up and think about them, this one came right. about by pure happenstance. Well, that's, you know, you, it, we're at the right time at the right place. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like... You know, uh, you know, it's like you haven't spoken about your muse, but in a way, it's the fact that you happen to be there and you're open to receive the information. I think that is a beautiful, beautiful way to summarize it. That's perfect. You know what I mean? So, it looks, and this piece here looks like, you know, at the top of her head, going from left to right, there's like a, like a ray of light. You see that coming off that wall? Yeah. Yeah, you see that? Yeah, it's cool, man. Good looking out. Good work. Thank you. Okay, this this is like one of those. Uh, this is what must be a piece from from those uh, Grimm's fairy tales or something, right? Well, yeah, you, you know, this one was another one I I kept visualizing. Sometimes I have these. Um, visual in, I, flashes of inspiration that just keep kind of, and you know, I kept visualizing a woman laying horizontal with this cloth spilling over. Mm -hmm. and, and my friend Jeannie um, posed, and boy, let me tell you, was this one a challenge? Be, and it was a challenge from the standpoint of design. And I spend a lot of time on design. And sometimes, um, it's a challenge to do that too, because if the light is changing quickly and I want to get those color notes, um, I'm thinking less about design and more about capturing what I'm seeing. Right, right, right. But, but to do a horizontal perspective like this and have a compelling design was, was really a very large challenge uh, so for me. Could you take me into your challenge, the world of the challenge for this piece? Well, yes, because, um, you know, I didn't want the, I knew that the horizontal uh, surface that she's on could not bisect the painting in half. Yeah. Um, if you do have a strong horizontal, you need to have um, a corresponding vertical. Um, the, her hip, the rise of her hip is more or less, um, more or less in the center um, but I needed to have, which was, which is uh, okay, but I needed to have some pull and heaviness in the way of the drape of the cloth and the vertical in the background to the right to kind of, because I, I had um, some lighter notes to the, to the left, so I needed to compensate by having some heavier notes to the right. Um, you know, doing the, how much of the background was very, as you can see, very suggestive. It certainly wasn't like that where she was posed. There was a lot going on, but I needed, I didn't want to emphasize any of that. Um, so, you know, basically I had to make sure that the surface she was on did not bisect the painting in half. And I had to have a sense of some strong verticals in the drape of the cloth and the tree, and also a few uh, diagonals, as you can see from, from the cloth as well. It, it, this was really a challenge. So what is, what is the story in this piece? 
Well, the title is called Reverie, and um, there isn't a specific story in this case, except um, one that the viewer might might find. Um, it, you know, I, I guess that in those moments alone when we're vulnerable and, um, you know, thinking about life and our minds go to to um, personal places, I, I guess that would be the extent of the story. Um, you know, is the, are these happy thoughts, sad thoughts, uh, pondering thoughts? Uh, who knows? That's for the viewer. I just thought that they were, they were part of the, like, she's out in nature, like she's being, uh, like, almost sacrificed to these, uh, like, in the Grimm's fairy tales, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I see what you're saying. No, in that particular case, no, I wasn't thinking about it in that in that context, but I can certainly see how that might be discerned. That's actually an interesting thought. Yeah. All right, go on to the next one, out of the woods, <laughs> into the forest. <laughs> yeah. Well, this one hit me like a lightning bolt. I was going through the, uh, one of the gals at the Festival of Arts, her daughter, uh, she helps the jewelers there. She's... Um, and we were, she was showing me pictures on her phone one day and she said, you know, my daughter's really into archery. Well, she showed me this photo and it wasn't anything like what, what you see here, but um, I just, it was a thunderbolt. I thought that's my next painting. I, I just, I, I was obsessed with it. I just knew it. So I asked if her daughter could bring her gear and compose and um, would she please wear a would you know would she wear a skirt and a blouse i already knew the i knew instantly the painting and i instantly knew the title girly girl oh, okay. and, and i um and maybe you know i was maybe it's a, it's a it, all art is a little bit i suppose of a self-portrait of the artist who did it i mean this was sort of i was kind of the type of girl that climbed trees in a skirt so uh -huh. you know, I, I was not a I was not a tomboy, but I wasn't a pink girl in pink ruffles either. So, you know, when I asked her to pose, would she, would she actually use her bow and arrow wearing a skirt and a blouse? And she said, "Oh yeah, she would." Well, you can't imagine my thrill when she showed up and pulled out her boots. And of course, you know, I recognized that you have to have heavy boots because you don't want the the, a sharp arrow to be hitting hitting your feet if you have lighter shoes or sandals on so you know that that was her gear as she would wear it and so she posed uh, for me in the field not too far away from where I live and I did a couple of studies of her and it was she was a wonderful model 12 years old and um it was, a, it was just, again, very fulfilling because the painting came to me. It was done in my head before the months before the, I, even, I even put a stroke down. But I spent a lot of time on the composition and placement of her in the landscape. How much foreground, how much background, where was she going to be, how large is the painting, etc. It shows because the dominant vertical, the dominant horizontal, your dominant Baroque and sinister lines are all there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I spent a tour. I did a, I put up a big piece of paper in my studio and I, you know, wh where's the top of her head relative to the top of the, the, the surface, the canvas? Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time. So thank, thank you. Yeah, it was, this one was very carefully designed. Who's this lady here? This is Rachel, and this came about, again, by complete accident. I had Rachel um, posing for another painting, and I, this was at, I was at my house, and um, I said, well, you know, the light's looking pretty good. Let's um, have you go outside and, and step into my neighbor's rose garden, and she did, and the rest was history. I, a thunderbolt moment that I could never have predicted, and I said, stop don't move and um i i did a quick study of her and um and this one is also a six foot pastel painting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it was uh it was a thrill to do from start to finish so now you know something here's, here's what i just saw for you right the thunderbolt lady right like, <laughs> when, when when that happens for you what happens is 
stuff just stops. And out of, out of the, the, the space comes this, this idea. It comes floating from where it comes from right to you. It does. And it, it settles there and it'll never leave. When, and when yeah. I finally, there's a feeling of getting the painting finished, there's a feeling of relief because now I can think about something else. Right. And I noticed in these two images, the six footers, both women are without shoes. They are. Yes. And I asked Rachel, I said, do you really, is it okay if you step into the garden without shoes on? She goes, oh yeah. She was kind of a nature girl. It didn't bother her at all. Well, right. So. There's that sense of being rooted into the, into the, into the land, into like, like, you know, trees, you know, trees have, uh, you know, limbs, but the limbs are, are the upper part of the lower roots. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's nice. I like that. So, what's, so who's this lady? This is another mystical this is, lady, right? This is uh, probably my, one of my favorite models of all time. And um, this is a painting that was, oh, months in the making because I wanted to paint somebody sewing, sewing a sail. I used to sail on my dad's boat. Okay. And, uh, and so I actually borrowed a sail. I went up to a sail making factory in Newport Beach um and i had one model didn't quite work out um i even in in the short in trying to figure out well, what am i going to do in the absence of a model i used myself as a model partly just to get the body pose because i just couldn't get what am i how am i going to set this up what am i going to do um <clears throat> and you know the 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 part, the hard part about this painting was um, focal point, and the fact is, I wanted, I wanted the sail to be the primary focal point. Of course, we always go to the face, the human face, but there had to be this really powerful focal point, and I wanted to make sure that the figure was more in the background and the sail in the foreground. Anyway, I finally. Uh, landed it was a model that i'd drawn before at san clemente art supply where we paint from the model and i called track down katrina and she was precisely the right model mm -hmm. and uh, she came over and posed for me and um but now i spent oh my gosh i spent months on this painting i did studies of the sails i analyzed leonardo da vinci's drawings of of draped cloth. I did black and white studies of, of, of draped cloth. I changed the clo clothing. I, you know, I, I took things out. I, uh, of, the, of the foreground and it was very, very involved painting. So, you know, it's, um, the people that bought this painting, um, they, it was, it was fun to get to know them too. So anyway, all, all of these paintings are all sold and it's been fun to, to get to know the people who, who bought them. And, um, this one had an interesting, this one had a really interesting story where they bought the painting. They're a Mormon family and, um, I have Mormon roots. Um, I'm not Mormon, but, uh, my uh, great, 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 grandfather was Mormon and he came from um, Missouri and the people that bought this painting handed me a book and they said we found your great 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 grandfather's house in this wow. book get out um, of here wow what a well, it, was, it was a shock yeah. or it came from Illinois Nauvoo Illinois so it was one of those moments where I did we didn't know there was this I, I had no idea and it was a very providential situation and um and uh, I, I get a kick out of the fact, really a thrill, when I go to their house and they, they showed me the painting and it's above their fireplace and on one side of the fireplace is a painting of Jesus Christ and on the other side it is a painting of Joseph Smith. So <laughs> I'm, I'm really honored. So anyway, and then I have this book where my great, great, great grandfather's house in Nauvoo, Illinois was restored. So very oh. provident set of circumstances that came together. So you have, you have the, you have the magic touch, right? Well, I don't know. I just follow the thread of inspiration, never sure where it's going to lead. So this no. was. Oops. Now, 
what you're back in the ocean now where, where you live well this is actually um i don't as you you would know and others who know me know i don't do a lot of landscape paintings um i did when i first moved to southern california i was out painting on the beach all the time um and i i uh it's not my first the landscape doesn't draw me, uh, you know, the figure and the still life draw me first, but um, I'm uh, part of this um, invitational landscape show. Actually, the show will be tomorrow. And uh, we were to paint four paintings of, the, of a certain area um, in California and submit them for the show. Okay. And uh, I, I really, it was a very, uh, providential and uh, wonderful experience for me to throw myself back into the landscape and you know one of the artists that I studied years ago everyone will know him as know who studies portraiture knows Everett Raymond Kinsler and he told somebody once one of his students that if you want to be a better uh, painter of the figure and portrait go out and paint the landscape well, I didn't really understand that 20 years ago. What, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that when you are painting the landscape, you really um, understand how natural light plays across the planes of a surface. And it, it teaches you rules um, about what light does. And um, so, you know, I... I have used this opportunity for this landscape show to shore up and just enjoy light on an, a surface other than a, the plane of a face or a flower, but the landscape itself. So, well, I, I like it. I think it's one of your stronger pieces. Thank you. Um, this we've had a lot of, this looks a little fuzzy, maybe I didn't have this on my screen, maybe I didn't send you a high enough resolution image, but it, it's okay. It's, uh, we've had a tremendous amount of rain here, and, um, well, I mean, it's raining men, finally, finally you got rain, you've been begging for rain. Finally, <laughs> I know, thank goodness, yeah, I, coming from the northwest, I, feel like I'm at home. I, I love it. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to, to document some of the, 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 I mean, the hills are emerald green. And, um, you know, it's very hard to paint greens and not have them be too sweet, but that is the way they look. And so this was, again, it, they're all experiments. This was an experiment in the, and also just wanting to do a document a little bit of, of what the, um, what the green around here looked like because you know uh most of the time the hills around here are brown they don't yeah, look like I that know. i lived in southern california and, and like okay you would never tell me this was in southern california <laughs> i know nobody can believe it so yeah. i guess well, yeah that's cross-section of my work so maybe that was what it was like when they in the original days you know when they first came maybe no. maybe i mean it's really it's just something and you know the wildflowers are just coming into bloom now it's 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 beautiful it's really beautiful so this is like a historical piece like you're documenting in a way yeah, yeah i mean you just said you and i just i thought i've just got to to capture this yeah. uh, while while i can because it's not going to stay it's like it's like believe it or not this is southern california exactly <laughs> And we're back to Mary Asler. There you go. You know, like I've been around the world through your work. <laughs> and it's, oh, that's nice. It's quite a world which you live. I mean, you're you're an exceptional woman. You know, you're exceptional. Oh. I, I like I like your work. I like your concepts. You know, your, your work ethic is par excellence. But just the way you do it, man, like you're in the zone. You get there and you follow the orders. That's important. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it, it's hard work and I feel a little bit um, silly. I mean, you know, cleaning toilets in an airport bathroom is, is, is real hard work. I don't do hard work compared to that. Um, but it's, it's a blessing. It's a real blessing. 
and um, very, very grateful. And so uh, whatever gifts I've been given, I, I have a responsibility to keep cultivating them and, and working very, very hard and, and following where the light and the beauty and the muse might, might lead. So. Well, before we sign off, some important questions I have to ask you. Yes. One, how can people contact you? <laughs> well, the best way is um, through my website, which is maryaslan.com. And I'm also on Facebook. Uh, those are probably the two best ways. Okay, and I guess the second question is, any important shows coming up that we could go see your work or anything like that you want to share? Well, um, I have a show at uh, the Forest and Ocean Gallery. Um, I have one piece in, the, in that show in April. It's called Birds, Bees, and Botanicals. It's sponsored by the Laguna Planar Painters Association. Okay. Um, I am taking a sabbatical from the Festival of Arts this year. I've been exhibiting there for eight continuous years. And um, this summer, I am continuing to develop a body of work of a uh, figure in the landscape and still life in the landscape. And I was able also to do these, these landscapes themselves by virtue of taking the sabbatical. So I will not be at the Festival of Arts in Laguna this summer, but I will be having some uh, open studios uh, and uh, love to have people visit me in my studio, which is in Laguna Beach, a couple miles up the road from the Festival of Arts. And I, I always uh, love to have visitors. So if for whatever reason, um, viewers find themselves in town and would like to drop by my studio and contact me, I'd be happy to welcome them. Sounds delicious. Now also, I, this is a topic for another discussion, so I won't get too deep into it, but I want to revisit you when you start doing your figures and landscape. Okay, I'll be doing more of those. I, um, I've got one on my easel right now. So I, it's a very favorite topic for sure. You know why so, I say that? Because in, that, in the seascape you showed us earlier. Yes. When you were talking about studying light. Well, uh -huh. what I saw was I saw faces. Oh. I saw faces in the rocks. Oh, very nice. So I like that. So that's, that's why I said, wow, this, wow, she's doing it already. She doesn't know that she's doing it. <laughs> well, I'm, gosh, you know, it's always fun when other people see things in my work that I don't see. And uh, that's, that's always a thrill. So thank you for that. All right, guys. I know you have lots of paintings to do, Mary. I won't keep any longer. And I really appreciate you being so professional with us and understanding our shortcomings and our technical difficulties. But this is Phil Jordan here again, ladies and gentlemen. But well, I'm very appreciative, Bill. Thank you very, very much. I'm incredibly honored that you contacted me and um, just just thrilled to, to be here. And um, it was just thank you. It's really a, a privilege to, to be interviewed by you. Thank you no, so thank much. You. It's going to be like, people are going to love this, man. You, you're throwing the light out there, you know, G major. <laughs> oh yes let's see what are the major keys let's oh. live that way yes yeah you know okay i gotta sign off you gotta go back to work bill jordan yes. here, guys, uh are with bill you can uh call me anytime i'm at 201-790-3368 get your swerve on here get your art out into the world or just enjoy the artists that come by that's all there is today peace out and let me see, we're done. Thank you, Bill.